Hello, and welcome to this Google Hangout. Um, this Google Hangout is part of Literature of the English Country House, a massive open online course at the University of Sheffield based in the School of English. Um, on the course this week, we're looking at the malevolent and reclusive owner, and we've been thinking a lot about Charles Dickens and Anne Radcliffe. In this discussion this evening, we're going to broaden that out and think a little bit more about Gothic literature more generally. Um, I'm Adam Smith. I'll be chairing the discussion this evening. I'm joined by Professor Angela Wright and Amber Regis, who you'll recognise from the steps this week if you've been taking the course. Um, we're taking your questions for the next hour. If you'd like to ask a question and you're watching on Google Hangout, there are nine dots in the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you click there, you can ask a question. You can also leave your questions in the corresponding step on the platform, or you can tweet us your questions using hashtag FLHouseLit. Um, but I thought we could just start by getting to know you guys a bit better and hearing a little bit about what your research is and, and what kinds of things you do in the School of English. Sure. Well, hello everyone, um, my name is Angela Wright, as Adam said, and I teach literature um, of a romantic period with a special emphasis upon Gothic literature. So, um, more broadly, I'm interested in literature of the 18th and 19th centuries, and I've published books upon um, Britain, France and the Gothic, um, books upon Anne Radcliffe, and I'm currently finishing off one of Mary Shelley right now. Um, I'm really interested in female authors. I write a lot about women's gothic, but I also broaden that out quite a bit because I'm also really intrigued by authors such as Matthew Lewis, who wrote really quite wicked gothic novels as well. <laughs> yeah, and I'm um, Amber Regis, and um, I'm a lecturer in 19th century literature at the University of Sheffield. My research looks at uh, Victorian life writing, so I'm really interested in biographies, autobiographies, letters, diaries, that, that kind of material. And on the platform this week, I'm talking about Great Expectations by Dickens, which is my favourite Dickens novel. It's also one of my favourite novels to teach. And um, a few years ago, I did a little bit of research about film adaptations and the representation of Miss Havisham's dress. So that's where my interest in that particular novel comes from. And I'm Adam Smith. I'm an 18th century, but tonight I'm just on the comms. So if you see me looking out of the corner of the screen, it's because I'm selecting the questions. And we've actually got a question here already. And it's from Daphne, Daphne uh, Shukart. And she says, there are really no conventional family units in Great Expectations. She's thinking of Pip, Miss Havisham, Mr. Wemmick, Mr. Jaggers, etc. And Daphne wants to know, is that something specific to Dickens stories? Or is it a feature of 19th century novels more generally? Well, it's certainly, it's well spotted, it's certainly a very, very common trope in Great Expectations. Lots of orphans, lots of wards, um, lots of uh, characters with uncertain family origins. And that is definitely something that's very common across many of, of Dickens' works. You only have to think about some of the more well-known titles, such as Oliver Twist, which is um, the, the progress of, of Oliver, an orphan, and finding out who he is and where he comes from. And um, Bleak House, we have the wards of Jarndyce who um, similarly um, don't have set fixed um, parental family units. And often in Dickens, it's that search for origins and um, the, the child or an adult that's been disenfranchised or dispossessed in some way, finding out who they are is what drives the, the narrative and the plot forward but this is something that Dickens um, was not alone in doing far from it and in fact I'm going to hand over to Angela because I know that this is a really important narrative and character sort of um, feature of earlier works. Yes that's right Amber um, if you go back to the history of the Gothic novel and um, you'll find particularly in the 1790s that uh, there are a spate of Gothic novels which feature orphan characters. You know, the Mysteries of Udolfo, which you've been looking at this week, Emily um, begins the novel with a mother and a father, but, you know, within the space of 30 or 40 pages, both of those parents have died, and it's about the orphan being cast out into the world. There's also another really famous novel that Jane Austen mentions in North Hanger Abbey, which is called the Orphan of Iran by Eleanor Sleep. It's one of the Northanger novels, which features an orphan who is adopted and brought up by a surrogate parent. And I think going into the 19th century, you see this trend continuing mm -hmm. in the authors that we know more 
wildly nowadays. And um, for example, in Jane Austen, Mansfield Park concerns a story of Fanny Price, who is actually taken from her family home in Portsmouth to be raised by her much richer relatives, the Bertrams, at Mansfield Park. And you'll find in Austen's novels there are many such small stories like that. Harry Smith, for example, and Emma is also a character who is closely associated with being brought up and raised by somebody else. And if you've read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, that's another very famous example. Victor Frankenstein may strike you as being somebody who has a very happy family background. You can't blame his background for what he decides to do in his ambitions. But if you look more closely, in the first edition of Frankenstein that was published in 1818, Elizabeth Lavenza, you know, who he marries at the end and who is killed, is his cousin who is raised by his mother and father. But in the 1831 edition of Frankenstein, which was the third edition of the novel, Elizabeth Lavenza becomes an orphan who is fostered into the Frankenstein family. So I think that Mary Shelley was also really interested and concerned about family units and is at pains to show, you know, family units that do not work or that have very different types of characters and relationships in them. And that doesn't mean to say that this figure of the orphan or the foster child is necessarily mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the disruptive force, because you couldn't say that of Pip, could that's you? Right, that's right. It, it, you, what you were saying there, Angela, makes me think that in, in several Dickens novels, actually, the, the biological family, for want of a better phrase, mm -hmm. is where the unhappiness might right. lie. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, a character or set of characters by the end of the novel will forge an alternative family unit. And it's those mm -hmm. odd family units that are the happiest. So perhaps the most famous example of that is at the end of Oliver Twist, mm -hmm. when Oliver is standing at the grave of his mother with a combination of carers um, and, and guardians that he sort of accumulated along the way. And, and I think Dickens refers to it as a little community. Mm -hmm. And there are mm -hmm. lots of those little communities mm -hmm. that, that are um, where alternative family um, structures can come good as well as they can be the source of sort of gothic intrigue in, in novels like um, Great Expectations. Yes, absolutely, mm. because there's also Bleak House and Esther Somerset, yeah. who is brought into the Jarndyce um, household as a ward of Mr Jarndyce, but then there's also the um, Ada and R Richard, mm. um, who are also in that household, mm. and they form a very strong community. Mm. Um, a community of light and goodness in, yeah. in some ways mm -hmm. that prevails throughout the very dark episodes of the novel. Mm -hmm. So it's a great topic. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, there's another question here actually following on from that on a similar theme of Gothic. and um, It's from Karina Gillan and she says, is the Gothic novel an antidote to the rise of rationalism, the question of religious certainties and the conflict arising after Darwin's theory of evolution, or am I putting too much emphasis on a genre whose purpose is to frighten? Well, that's a, 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 an interesting question as well, because I think the Gothic novel begins, um, history tells us, in 1764 with Horace Walpole's mm. The Castle of Otranto. And he begins to write that after a dream, where he sees in his inner sight a giant hand clad in armour um, coming down the stairs, and that's really an intriguing genesis for the start of this story. Um, moving on to 1816, the summer where Mary Shelley begins to compose Frankenstein, she later tells us again that it is a dream um, that actually gives rise to that. So, um, Corinna, I think one of the things is Yes, you could see it as an antidote to the rise of rationalism in the 18th century, a reaction against Enlightenment values, mm. um, of which Adam also knows something as an 18th century scholar. But one of the things about it is 
that many authors, and Anne Radcliffe in particular, you know, actually are still skeptical about the supernatural. So we can't group all of the Gothic novels together in that way because Anne Radcliffe plays with our fears about ghosts. But in the end, I don't want to spoil the plot of a Udolfo for anyone watching, but at the end of her fiction, she often has a more rational explanation for the fears and terrors that she presents to her heroines. Mm -hmm. Amber will be able to comment about 19th century yeah. Darwin. So, On the Origin of Species is published in 1859, and um, the shockwaves from, from that book, they're, they're perhaps slightly delayed. It, it, is a, it is one of those sort of amazing books that, that changes the world, but, but the, the sort of effects of that are relatively slower to, to, to kick in than we might think. But what it does mean is that um, Gothic clearly predates Darwin, but Gothic post-Darwin does tend to um, bring into play certain anxieties that Darwin's theories also raised in, in society. Darwin, in the, on, our, on the origin of species, says nothing about humanity. He's very, very guarded about that issue. And in fact, um, towards the end of On Origin of Species, he says, um, these are my ideas, but I leave it to future um, scientists, future researchers to plow the open fields. And that's his phrase, the open fields of the, the implications of his, of his reasoning. Um, he does later come back and do this himself in The Descent of Man in the 1870s, but he leaves it open in 59. Um, so what we might be able to trace across into the way that Gothic literature um, changes and itself evolves in the second half of the 19th century is, is using Gothic plots and Gothic characters to plough those open fields, to see and to interrogate um, the origin of humanity and potentially the future of humanity, because on, origin, uh, on the origin of species is about looking back to a point of origin, but its, but its, um, its consequences, its, in, its impacts are about um, the future, so the possibility of extinction and the end of, of humanity. And in several key Gothic texts that come out in the second half of the, of the 19th century, and I'm thinking in particular of Jekyll and Hyde and Dorian Gray, one anxiety, one um, way in which Gothic is interrogating the rationalism, the cold rationalism of this, this new world view, is thinking about how evolution might possibly be devolution and how humanity might degenerate. Um, so in, so in, in Jeff and Hyde and Dorian Gray, this takes similar, um, manifest similarly, uh, it's about the morality of, of central characters. But in Dorian Gray, you have so the beautiful young, um, well-to-do uh, Dorian, who has, you know, he should be, you know, the apotheosis of humanity. This is the, the high point of, of, of man's evolution. But at that apotheosis, it all starts to, to, to crumble and it's the sort of the, the animal within that, that, that starts to come out. Um, so I think that is a, there is a sort of trace of Darwin in those later manifestations, but also those anxieties are, are there before Darwin too. So they're mm -hmm. there in Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think monstrosity is certainly a big mm -hmm. theme of the 19th century. And that's what makes the Gothic novel evolve from Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis mm -hmm. in the 1790s. But with Frankenstein, you know, we're faced with the creation of a creature who begins as being enlightened and rational. But, you know, when he is confronted by the evils of society, the way that society begins to shun him, he himself turns into what we now know as a monster. And that continues, that um, focus upon monstro monstrosity continues quite consistently across the 19th century Gothic. That's interesting you said that um, Horace Walpole had the idea in a dream mm -hmm. from Casper Franco. Yes. Because didn't Mary Shelley say something similar about yeah. Frankenstein? She did, yes. Uh -huh. she, she had this same um, account that she puts in the preface to the 1831 edition of Frankenstein, where she talks about the dream very carefully. She talks about the way the moon was streaming through the shutters 
on Lake Geneva, where she was at the time that she had this dream. She talks about the parquet flooring and the shadows that the moon casts upon that flooring. And what she says is that I saw the student on how darts kneeling down. And what she sees is a student who is trying to create life. And it's clearly seen as being a blasphemous practice in her dream. What emerges in the novel Frankenstein, of course, is far more complex than that. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a question here uh, from someone called Anna Simington. It says that she was sitting in Sheffield looking at the rain falling and her thoughts mm -hmm. turned to the 100th anniversary of the year without a summer. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, could you talk a little bit more about what happened in 1816 and how it affected the development of Gothic literature post Radcliffe? I mean, you're in a great position to ask this question right now, aren't you, Angela? I am, yes, so. Well, recently, um, with colleagues in the School of English, including Amber and Adam, <laughs> and we organised a big conference called the Summer of 1816 Creativity and Turmoil to celebrate the 200th anniversary of that year without a summer, where Mary Shelley and her husband, well, later her husband, Percy, plus Lord Byron and John Polidori and Claire Claremont gathered on Lake Geneva at the Villa Diodati for this ghost story competition and spent a summer there. It was a summer that was described as having absolutely no sunshine due to the atmospheric conditions that had been created by the eruption of a volcano, Mount Tambora, and um, which had cast this preternatural darkness across Europe. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that emerges from that are two fantastic Gothic fictions. Mm -hmm. And Frankenstein is justifiably, I think, the most recognised and celebrated Gothic work. But we mustn't also forget that John Polidori created The Vampire mm -hmm. during that same ghost story competition. And The Vampire is really our first sustained introduction to a figure that becomes so important in the 19th century. Absolutely. If it wasn't for Polidori's Vampire, um, and that came out a few years, when did 1819, 1819 yes. that was published. And one of the things that Polidori does is he takes the, the European vampire folk, folklore myths and he gives us that recognisable figure of the aristocratic, mm -hmm. um, seductive figure that Bram Stoker takes. So yeah. Stoker's Dracula is based upon Lord Ruther. And so that, that template really emerges at that, that crucial moment in 1816. Yes, definitely. Mm. And it's seen as being a very European type of story mm. because, you know, the story takes us from cosmopolitan London mm. and very stuffy society evenings where <laughs> Lord Ruther appears mm. um, and right across Europe to Greece. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you get this great panorama that persists in vampire fictions of the 19th mm -hmm. century. So, yeah. um, there's a question here that relates to one of the activities on the moot this week. So mm -hmm. one of the activities has, that presents the multiple endings of Great Expectations yes. and invites learners to choose, well, mm -hmm. to decide what they would do with that situation, yeah. where you've got multiple texts that all come from the same author, how do you decide which one to publish? Um, mm -hmm. And Jean B has a question here for Amber. Mm -hmm. It says, so we chose which endings we like, we, we favoured, um, but which do you prefer? Being much more familiar with the novel and the history than I am, I wondered which you preferred and why. I was torn between the serialised ending and the published. Obviously. Yes, I'm going to answer that question in two ways, if I may, which is my, my personal preference, which is actually a different answer to what I would do as an editor. So my personal preference is I like and enjoy the, the manuscript ending the best. So this is, this is the ending that Dickens did not publish and ultimately just filed away in his, in his notes. So this is the ending that Edward Bulwer-Lytton advised him to change for some reason. Those reasons are probably commercial. It's probably a sense in which you can't spend nine months setting up this story and then have it end unhappily. Um, but, but for me, there's something in that unhappy ending that rings truer to the story. So my personal preference of the, of the three endings that Dickens writes in his lifetime is, the, is actually the manuscript ending. But as an editor, 
that for me is the only ending that I couldn't choose um, for my edition. If I was to, to edit an edition to, to go to go on sale, and that's because that is the only ending that Dick, Dickens did not publish. So as an editor, I have to think with my head and not my heart. And for, for me, an editor um, has to decide between the serialization ending and the library edition ending as, as the two um, legitimate options for a, for a scholarly edition. Which is, I'm thinking of a, a textbook, I suppose, for students, what, what I would do for that. Um, they both have equally legitimate claims to be chosen, and I don't know which one I would choose. So you could choose the serialization and you can justify that claim on the basis that this is the ending that the first readers encountered. And that's a legitimate justification, I think, for choosing the serialization. But you could equally as justifiably choose the library edition ending, which has got the slightly different wording in that final sentence. And you can justify that by saying, this is the final version that Dickens chose. This is the last time he revised. This is his final vision. Mm. So final authorial intention would be the justification for the library edition. But you, you can really um, sort of equally justify the serialization and, and the later change. Of those two, I again prefer <laughs> slightly more ambiguous serialization <laughs> ending because he changes the word, the wording of the final sentence, and it seems far more certain that Pip and Estella are going to be reunited mm -hmm. in, in 1862. Whereas in 1861, I can't quite remember the phrasing, but the sentence is slightly awkward, and in that awkward, there's a, a discomfort and a sense of ill ease that something is not. This isn't happily ever after, mm. it seems. But mm. though, yes, it's, um, those kinds of puzzles are what makes textual editing a headache, but also a real joy, mm. I would say. Are there any yeah. comparable um, instances in Radcliffe? Or... Mm. No, not in Radcliffe. Um, I'm trying to think. I can't think of any places. Well, Matthew Lewis, famously, mm. He was a contemporary of Anne Radcliffe who published A Monk in 1796. But um, when it was revealed that the author was a member of parliament, <laughs> and he was absolutely lambasted in the periodical press for his publication of such a, a licentious novel because the monk is far different to the mysteries of Udolpho. Mm -hmm. um, it involves incest and and rape and so on and so forth. It's quite a shocking read in many ways. And um, Lewis was put under considerable pressure and he was almost trying for blasphemy. Um, and even Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a romantic poet, who wrote a review of a monk, said that you know he should you know he hinted that he should almost be prosecuted for it. So feelings ran high. And in consequence of that, Matthew Lewis modified the ending of the monk. The evil monk Ambrosio still gets his comeuppance um, in spectacular fashion. I won't spoil it in case you'd like to read it. But he added something else on it, a more moralizing ending, which was about to judge your conduct of others more harshly than yourself is wrong. And that was seen as actually being a response to the way that he was judged for writing a, a work of fantasy and a work of literature, um, which you know he was permitted to do. I might just have a follow-up question um, for you, Angela, which is um, any editor of Frankenstein has a very, very big decision to make right at the very beginning of their mm -hmm. editorship, which is which version of Frankenstein to use yes. as their copy text. Do you use the original 1818 edition or do you use the revised 1831 edition and I wondered what your thoughts were about the pros and cons of yes, that choice. That's an interesting question because there's also a middle edition, oh, a second edition that. <laughs> and that's recently been brought out by Broadview Press oh, in Canada yeah. which is between the 1818 and the 1831 so slight changes mm. are made there but the major revisions are made to the 1831 edition and I think, for me, I always teach from the 1818 edition. Mm -hmm. And if I were to edit it, I would actually like to um, produce a, an edition of the 1818. Mm -hmm. But that said, the 1831 
in some ways sharpens the criticism of Victor Frankenstein and it makes the character of Elizabeth Lavenza, you know, the unprotesting female who waits patiently at home for Victor Frankenstein while he creates a new human being. It makes her character far more rounded and fully formed. She is described in her own right as a poet. Yeah. And as I said before, you know, she she moves from being a cousin of Victor's, which suggests a slightly incestuous mm -hmm. theme in 1818, to actually being no blood relation of his. But there's something about the disposability of her, because in 1831, um, she's introduced to Victor Frankenstein by Victor's mother as, I have a little gift for you, Victor. Mm -hmm. And it's as if she is a possession mm -hmm. of Victor's to be played with. So I think that Mary Shelley sharpens latent themes about women's rights and women's independence in 1831. Mm -hmm. So personally, in some ways, that becomes a little bit closer to my heart. Yeah. And it also becomes slightly more gothic. She talks mm -hmm. about terror. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> that sounds great. The middle one. Yes, the middle one is good. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> um, so, a question here for both of you. It seems that both Jane Austen and Charles Dickens have a negative view of parents and parenting skills. <laughs> uh, is this typical of 18th and 19th century attitudes, or is it a case of bad parents makes good plots? Um, uh, just reading that, I immediately yeah. thought of the very end of Northanger Abbey, which I can't remember the line now. Yeah. Whether it's the reader to decide whether it's in support of filial disobedience oh. or parental tyranny. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great line, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think bad parents do make good plots. I think that's a <laughs> very pithy way of, of summing it up as well, Corinna. Um, this goes back to that earlier question about um, unusual family units. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're quite closely connected. Um, and perhaps where a novel um, is drawing in Gothic themes or is explicitly a, a Gothic novel, this becomes even more important because um, so many Gothic novels have um, the question of origins um, as, as part of the makeup of, of the plot and the characters, or there's some sort of blood feud um, or, or, or dispute between warring families or, or something like that right at the heart. So sort of parents and families and bloodlines and origins are just so um, essential, it seems, to this particular mode of, of, of storytelling. Um, but I'm going to hand directly over to Angela because I know this is actually a burgeoning research topic of yours. Well, yes, it is. I think um, families are fascinating in the 18th and 19th century. If you think in the 18th century about um, you know, the history of Tom Jones by Henry Fielding, mm -hmm. that's about an orphan. And, you know, there are orphans right throughout literature. Um, do um, bad families persist? Yes, absolutely. Um, Horace Walpole in The Castle of Otranto has a father who accidentally murders his daughter <laughs> <laughs> because he wants to kind of persist in creating his bloodline and is chasing another young female the same age as his daughter in order to try to procreate and create a male heir. And Walpole uses this phrase from um, the Bible, the sins of a father are visited on the children to the third and fourth generation at the end of the Castle of Otranto because it's all about the tyrant Manfred's sins. Um, in not actually taking care of his own children and in actually seeing or recognising the value of family simply in the, the propagation of a bloodline. Mm -hmm. And I think that that becomes really essential to Gothic literature and to literature mm -hmm. more broadly in the 19th century. You know, the question of what family is. Mm -hmm. Is it simply about passing on um, inheritance, whether that's financial or about characteristics, or is family about something more valuable? Because if you think about Jane Austen, um, what characterises Catherine Morland's family in Northanger Abbey is that they are poor because her father is a vicar, but actually they're relatively happy. You know, the mother educates the children. And in fact, as it says in the first page of Northanger Abbey, she's in glowing hell. 
Now, if you compare that to the Bertram family, for example, in Mansfield Park, Sir Thomas Bertram is largely absent because he's away in Antigua looking after his sugar plantations and thinking about the persistence of his family in terms of financial inheritance rather than actually looking out for his daughters, one of whom elopes. So there's a, there's a sense in Austin that good families are families who actually take care of each other and educate each other rather than mm. become concerned about financial inheritance. And I think you know, that keeps going in the mm. 19th century as a theme. Um, next up is a Miss Havisham question. So Gail A asks, was Miss Havisham's utter devastation of being jilted because the role of women from the country house class was to secure a husband and produce a family? Mm -hmm. Her fiancé had, in effect, brought her life to an end when he jilted her. If a woman failed to achieve marriage, her life as a spinster was worthless and she became an object of pity as well as a financial burden on her family. It's no wonder, Gail writes, that she wanted to exact revenge. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Yes, so there's a lot there's a lot going on in that question. I'll have to quickly read through it again on the screen. Yes, so um, as the daughter of a family where she had brothers, at least one brother, I can't remember the details now, and um, it was Miss Havisham's social responsibility, her, her familial duty, her social role to marry um, and to marry well. And this she does not do. So yes, in a in a sense that she has failed to fulfil a particular ex social expectation. And as a result of that, um, there's a sort of death in life um, situation that she finds herself in. She's a sort of uncanny, catatonic um, character, frozen while everything um, falls apart around her. One of the things that's quite interesting about Miss Havisham's jilting is just how um, premeditated it is. So it's all part of an elaborate um, plot between Compayson, the fiance and Havisham's brother. Havisham's brother <clears throat> sort of sets up Miss Havisham. So Compayson persuades Miss Havisham to buy her brother out of the brewery. So brother gets a big pile of cash and then Compayson and the brother Scarper. So she's, she's been robbed basically. She's been robbed and she's been left with this house um, and no, not as much money as she did have, although clearly she's still quite wealthy. She was 28 when this happened, and that is, it's very young, um, but that is comparatively old to, to be marrying, um, and the, the novel is set back as well, so it's, this is round about, um, this is round about the turn of the century, round about 1800 or so, when, when Miss Havisham would have been getting married. She was a very, she was already sort of an extraordinary bridal figure and the her age is, is also part of making that jilting um seem like seem part of you know i'm not being very um, articulate but it's part, part of making it seem that it was extraordinary that she even believed this this guy was was in love with her and was going to marry her so it, it, it sort of emphasizes emphasizes that she she had fa already failed once and because she was 28 and unmarried and here she was failing again because she didn't get the ring on her finger um, one could argue that in 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 representing that single woman in the way that Dickens does that this is a this is a quite this is this is actually quite a misogynist portrayal of the mm. superfluous woman problem which was very much in the news in the mid in the mid century um, the census results had revealed that there was about half a million or so more women than men in the United Kingdom at that time and around about the time sorry that Dickens was writing and so there's all this debate in the press at the time about what are we going to do with all these women because there aren't enough men to marry them we're going to have to work out what to do with them. So this reopens the debate started in the 18th century by people like Mary Wollstonecraft about women's education, women's ability to hold down um, paid employment. There were even proposals to send these superfluous women abroad um, just to sort of remove the problem and send them to the colonies. So Dickens, um, Dickens is tapping into this real anxiety about the figure of the superfluous woman and 
yes, it was a sort of death in life, end of her end of her expectations when she when she can't fulfil that social role. Um, and there has been a sort of drive to recover Miss Havisham in a certain sense to read her as. Um, She's, doing, she's going about it wrong, but she's exercising power and agency. So yeah, of course she's angry to be jilted and she, she's exacting revenge. So she retains some sort of mm-hmm. power as well. So it's a really complicated figure. It's a great question. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting as well in relation to the mysteries of you don't mm-hmm. Because one thing that we don't really get to talk about much is that Montoni is an illegitimate owner of Udolfo. And it transpires in the story that it is owned by a woman, mm. um, Laurentini, um, who is single, who has made a, a, a bad choice in terms of her object of love because he's a married man. And um, then she has been kind of thrown over by this and becomes a nun. So she leaves you, Jolfo, and in, in the wake of her disgrace, Montoni is able to assume power of it. Mm. But again, she is described as being an older woman, mm-hmm. one might imagine around about the age of 20 as well, <laughs> who owns this major castle in Italy, but who is displaced because of a, a bad choice of mm-hmm. lover, as it were. This is why it's so important to read Jane Austen's Persuasion as an, yes. as, as an antidote to all this, because um, Anne Elliot, the, the female protagonist, She's 27, so she's a year yeah. younger. Um, but that's that's a novel about second chances, mm. um, yes. of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're feeling a bit angry about poor Miss Havisham, go and read Persuasion. Yes. <laughs> and it comes with Anna Sailors. Well, Added Sailors, yes. yes. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Paul Heath, which I'm going to cite, because I think this is a really important question for when we're discussing the Gothic. Um, Paul says, could you expand and explain a little more about the word sublime mm-hmm. as it relates to the Gothic novel? Yes, uh, um, well, the sublime is a theory that has been with us um, since you know ancient classic texts from Greek. And um, Longin has wrote a treaty of the sublime way back many centuries ago. And in the 18th century, I think um, interest revives in it. it. It never really went away, but Edmund Burke, who was a politician as well as an author, wrote a famous treatise of a sublime calling called A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful in 1757. And in 1757, Burke argued that sublimity was about obscurity. It's about not being able to, to kind of perceive a mountain in its entirety, or not being able to see the contours of what is going to happen in a novel. So sublimity is something that you could experience, say, standing on top of a mountain, facing another mountain, and seeing how vast and expansive it is, something that you cannot frame in your physical eye. But sublimity for for Burke also was something that you could gain from actually reading a novel that sense of breathlessness, of terror and of anticipation and not knowing what was going to happen was something that was closely associated with the Gothic. And um, it was further theorised by other theorists in the 18th century, such as John and Anna Letitia Aiken, who wrote a, a pamphlet called on the um, pleasure of objects derived from terror. And then Anne Radcliffe herself wrote an essay on the supernatural in poetry that was published after her death. And all of them talk about terror as being the principal agent of the sublime. Terror is something that you cannot see. You feel it and it makes you breathless. You want to read on or you want to stay looking at that mountain, but it's not the same as horror. Horror is something where everything is laid out before you. And in consequence, the thing about the Gothic is that your imagination is stimulated by actually reading something where you don't know what's going to happen, rather than actually reading something where everything is laid out in front of you. So it's about the threat of something happening rather than the actuality of it happening. 
I hope that makes sense. <laughs> mm. Just very quickly, there's a question here that actually works nice as a follow-up, and that's why do you think readers enjoy being frightened? Mm. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, I could relate it a little bit mm. to why I started studying Gothic literature, mm. because um, it derived from a fear and fascination during my teenage years for ghost stories. I would terrify myself at night time by reading ghost stories in bed, just as, you know, the 18th century readers of Gothic fiction were often described. And that sense of something actually taking over your faculties so that you could not sleep was so potent that it remained a big agent for me to read on mm -hmm. and read more things. I wanted to understand mm -hmm. where my fears came from. Mm -hmm. And of course, fears may be about monsters hiding under beds, but they're mm -hmm. also about more concrete anxieties, such as the position of women, mm -hmm. you know, in relation to marriage in the 18th and 19th century that Amber has been talking about. And they can be in relation um, to political change as well. So that sense mm. of fear actually articulating something that's far more close to home is something that yeah. remains really powerful for me. And it's um, a genre through which um, our imaginations can test the very limits of the possible and the impossible. Mm. And that's that's an incredibly um, appealing thing to do and, and I think it's 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 something that that gothic shares with um, other genres of speculative fiction mm -hmm. I know Adam's a big sci-fi fan <laughs> so um, sci-fi very very different to, to, to the gothic but within the sort of broader realms of speculative fiction they're doing similar things that mm -hmm. testing of the possible and the impossible and the very limits of, sort of human endeavor yes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yes because I mean I, I agree that Broadly, they're seen as being very distinct mm -hmm. categories, science fiction and gothic. But at the same time, you know, another like Frankenstein mm -hmm. has it's and so can great. be described yeah. in both mm -hmm. categories mm -hmm. because right. they're both doing very similar things and imagining mm -hmm. what the limits are of what we can tolerate yeah. as human beings. Yeah, absolutely. And it just, it just makes me think suddenly that the monolith in Space 2001 is a sublime object. Yes. and. Um, mm -hmm. Um, genres of fantasy as well draw very heavily upon um, upon the gothic tropes. That's not me, but yeah. On yeah. a much lower brow note, uh, a conversation I've been having on the MOOC this week was about the difference between horror and terror. And uh, I was talking about Lewis and Rankin, and I was using the Alien film franchise <laughs> to say that the, the Alien film is, I think, terror. Yes. You barely see the Alien, it's all about yes. suspense, whereas mm -hmm. Aliens. It's all about shooting the aliens, isn't it? And then being everywhere and jumping out on you. So, uh, <laughs> That's a good um, analogy, Adam. I often explain it to students as being, you know, terror is a film such as The Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. where you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you're there with the victim with a very shaky camera mm -hmm. and versus a film that I cannot watch because I find it too horrific which would be the Texas Chainsaw mm -hmm. Massacre, where everything's laid out, mm -hmm. yeah. nothing is left to your imagination mm -hmm. about what happens to those victims. Mm -hmm. Which is for like a monk, isn't it? That's the, yeah. the Mysteries of Udolpha, yeah. which is all about terror and mm -hmm. suspense, as you say, versus a monk. I think yes. if they made an adaptation of the monk, it mm -hmm. would just be, I would be able to watch it, it'd be horrible. <laughs> yes, well, they we made one in 2013. This is the French one. The French yeah. one, the yeah. one. <laughs> which is a fascinating adaptation because they they change it quite yes. a lot, don't they? Which I think is a smart move yes. <laughs> for, for, a, for a film in terms of it being a film that I can actually watch. Yeah. Um, actually, following on from that conversation, somebody had asked, in recent years there seems to have been a resurgent interest in the Gothic. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is and to what extent do you think uh, Gothic today pays a debt to Radcliffe for a mm -hmm. I guess Dickens as well. Yes. What, what? Just sort of linking back to something I said earlier, the Darwin question about how Gothic um, as, a, as a mode is, is so flexible and able to um, interrogate sort of all contexts, really. So one of the reasons why I would suggest that it's always been with us since its sort of birth in the 18th century is that it's just been used to examine whatever is our contemporary anxiety. Mm. Um, so late 19th century Gothic um, 
manifests very differently and it's very interesting different kinds of things but it's it's speaking to the debates at the time mm. and 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 what was what is what is the fear of, of that moment so it, it can it, it's it's like a chameleon genre it can completely reinvent itself over yes. and over again um and i'm going to hand it because you're far more expert on this than me um I'm gonna hand it well <laughs> i mean it 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 is true that gothic mm. seems to be everywhere nowadays mm. and you know we see that in the prevalence of vampire series on the television and mm. um, also if you look at a recent film like Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak mm. and the director Guillermo del Toro when he created that film said that he was going back to the gothic fiction of Anne Radcliffe and I think that we are seeing a return to the aesthetics mm -hmm. of the late 18th century, the conjuring of ghosts. Vampires are a big trope, yes. And nowadays it's all about zombies as well. And there's lots of zombie stuff out it. And as Amber mm -hmm. says, it's about the anxieties of the moment mm -hmm. and how you can get monstrosity to speak to that. But I think that you can actually trace all of these things back to Anne Radcliffe as well. And that sense of, you know, a lone, vulnerable female actually confronting real and present danger, whether that be in the form of Tom Hiddleston, Jessica Shastain, um, a ghost who's actually trying to protect her from these two human beings, or whether it's in the form of a zombie coming to get you, um, as in the, the book and film World War Z. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still the idea of a lone vulnerable figure mm -hmm. being confronted by a force that's much stronger and um, much greater than them in some ways. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that the other day when I was watching uh, Game of Thrones, which isn't a programme I think of as being particularly gothic, mm -hmm. but there's the character Jon Snow who lives on the mm -hmm. wall in the north on his own mm -hmm. in a castle, mm -hmm. terrorised by zombie yes. white walkers. That's right. yeah. And then, spoiler alert, it turns <laughs> out that he has a, heri a familiar heritage he didn't know about. Yes. So mm -hmm. the whole point is that he's cast out because of his illegitimacy yes. and then discovers that actually he has this noble heritage, which is also gothic trope isn't it? Yes. Discovering a mm -hmm, family mm -hmm. that can fix everything in the yes. only power. Well that is a plot spoiler right? because oh, I will come to that episode but <laughs> I, I, I think that with Game of Thrones uh, the wall is absolutely all about that. It's like the barbarians are coming but the awful thing about the wall in Game of Thrones is that you cannot visualise what is beyond it until it actually comes and then it's truly spectrum Mm. you know the characters who actually come to invade mm. um, and they're very ancient figures of monstrosity i think mm. and I, I find it intriguingly gothic as well mm. yeah. um so this is a very important question from uh, amelia cunning and she mm. says could you discuss the contribution of gothic literature to the nature of literature in this country house so like if we've got our country house mm. tradition of literature Mm -hmm. How does Gothic influence or impact upon that? Well, if I start and then I hand over to Amber because she'll talk about the 19th century context. Mm -hmm. But um, just to talk about the imagined readership of the Gothic novel in the late 18th century, the imagined reader of the mysteries of Udolfo. Now, because Gothic was so popular and omnipresent, and um, everybody was buying it and reading it in the 1790s. A lot of criticism arose at the authors of Gothic novels um, about, you know, what are you doing? You're filling young ladies' heads with fears. Um, you're filling them with democratic notions as well about their agency and their independence. Now, there was a, a real concern and unanimity to those anxieties that were articulated in the 1790s because of course the people who were able to either go to a subscription library or else purchase a four volume novel such as the mysteries of udolfo those people were people with leisure and a certain income who could actually you know spend time reading a four volume gothic novel 
And of course, these are the, the young unmarried ladies of the English country house. And you see in many popular enga engravings of the time that this imagined young unmarried female reader is closely associated with the Gothic readership. For example, a, a painting such as Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare, where you have a young lady kind of spread voluptuously upon a couch with a succubus and um, kind of sitting on her breast and um, is a really shocking image. But if you look closely at the paraphernalia surrounding that young lady, it is clear that she is leisured, that she's living in a very sumptuous house, possibly in the country. And therefore, you know, it's the idea of that monstrosity is invading that closely protected space of a country house. And that, I think, also pervades North Anger Abbey too, um, in many ways, because Catherine Morland is chastised by Henry Tilney for bringing fears and terrors into the English domestic space of North Anger Abbey. And in some ways she's justified. But what Northanger Abbey also teaches us is that Henry Tilney reads the mysteries of Udolfo too, with his mm -hmm. hair standing at end the whole time. And that, you know, if critics went on relentlessly about young women having their heads turned wild with Gothic novels, that wasn't entirely mm -hmm. true because young men read them too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking um, of what the 19th century and beyond might have inherited from 18th century Gothic in terms of its representation of country houses in literature. And I think what it boils down to possibly in the 19th century is that um, there's an inheritance of suspicion um, that, the, that the country house, rather than being um, the, the sort of utopian space that we've been looking at earlier in early weeks on the on the MOOC and a far more um, sceptical way of looking at the, the English country house, which is a direct inheritance from those Gothic tropes. That might manifest itself in various ways. So there's a continuation of um, a tradition of representing country houses as Gothic spaces. Mm -hmm. That's still with us. Um, Sarah Waters is still doing that. Um, Kazuo Ishiguro still does mm -hmm. that. We've, we've never lost that. Um, I think. So there's almost been a sort of fundamental change in mm -hmm. country house literature because of the, the Gothic moment in the 18th century. But we also laugh, far more willing to laugh at it as well. And Northanger Abbey, I think, is a really important text in mm -hmm. that tradition because it's bringing the two together. Um, so you have um, I mean, Agatha Christie is a relatively straight crime writer in the sense that it's not necessarily played for, for gags, but there's a sort of an excess in the way that, that English Country House might be the, the scene of uh, murder after murder after murder mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a writer like Agatha Christie or in writers like P.G. Woodhouse, where there's just farcical. Mm -hmm. They're just farcical spaces. And I think they're very different to Gothic novels, but they all come back to that fundamental suspicion and scepticism about those spaces um, that the Gothic introduces in that 18th century moment. And English country house literature is not recovered, I don't think. It's <laughs> yeah. still very sceptical about those spaces. Um, yeah. For instance, mm -hmm. um, atonement, mm -hmm. uh, Ian McEwan's atonement. Mm -hmm. This is a... This is a the English country house in that novel, which is very, very different to something like um, The Mistress of Udolpho, and yet it still has a, a house where crimes are committed, where secrets, and mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. so um, yeah. it's, it's fundamentally changed the English country house literature. Mm -hmm. I, I yes, say. another mm -hmm. great example from the 19th century is sensation fiction, you know, mm -hmm. a novel such as Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Lady Audley's Secret, mm -hmm. which is about a country house as well, which starts with a very precise physical description of a country house before you're introduced to any characters. Mm -hmm. So that the country house in some ways has the kind of malevolent personality mm -hmm. and only afterwards are you introduced to a character like, you know, Lady Audley, who it transpires as a criminal. Mm -hmm. And Robert Audley, meanwhile, is a detective mm -hmm. who lies around reading romances mm. that one can imagine are perhaps gothic romances. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we are coming to time. Um, thank you, everyone, for all of the questions. We've not mm -hmm. managed to answer them all, but certainly Sean Reckoning, our mentor, and I will go through any left on the platform at the end of the night and do what we can to answer those. But there's one here that I'd like to end on, actually. It's from Patrick McGraw, and he said, I'm definitely interested in learning more about Gothic novels. Is there one or maybe two that you could recommend as starting points? And I thought we could end by just maybe mm -hmm. recommending one each. Very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Has anyone got one to hand? Go, go for it. <laughs> oh, there's loads. Um, <laughs> But because of the way um, my work has been changing in the last year or so, what I, um, the book I'm going to recommend is an absolute classic. It's probably something you've already read, but if you haven't, read Jane Eyre. Um, so Charlotte Bronte is, and all, in fact, all the Bronte siblings are absolutely indebted to the romantic writers that they were brought up reading and the representation of Rochester and Thornfield. Um, just us so indebted to the Byronic hero and to, to writers like Anne Radcliffe. Um, it's just extraordinary um, that that novel, well, it just was written really. Uh, it, it, can be very e it can be very easy for us, I think, to forget how shocking that book was and how that book was read and reviewed in 1847 when it was published. So if you have already read Jane Eyre and want to maybe think and about how to recapture the initial shock of what is now very familiar text. One thing you could do is to go out and seek out some of the original reviews and to see just how shocked and appalled mm -hmm. some of the reviewers were. One famous review of Jane Eyre, this is before Charlotte Bronte's authorship of that book was, was known, um, said that if Cora Bell is a woman, then she is a woman who has long forfeited the company of her own sex. Mm. It was absolutely damning, um, this review. And so to capture some of the, the anxieties raised by Bronte's gothic treatment of the country house in, in Jane Eyre, Reread re the novel if you've not read it before, mm -hmm. uh, if you've read it before, and then seek out some of those reviews. Mm. Mm. I'm going to go slightly differently here, <laughs> um, and it's to do with the discussion that we've been having, because I'm a huge fan of Gothic fiction. Um, I love Anne Radcliffe and Mary Shelley, and you may have been reading Anne Radcliffe for the MOOC, and I hope that you have, because I love to convert people to Anne <laughs> <laughs> um, But I'm going to say, Take a punt and go back to 1764 and read the first Gothic novel that appeared in Britain, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole. Um, it's got fantastic prefaces. The first time that he wrote a preface, he actually claimed that it was a translation of a, a work from the Dark Ages, mm -hmm. um, translated by one William Marshall Gent. There's an interesting story behind that pseudonym. And it makes you laugh, and it makes you scared in equal proportion, I think. And um, students um, often grapple with the tone of it because there are absurd moments in it, and then there are moments of true terror when that young woman, Isabella, is running through the corridors being hounded by Manfred. And the ghosts are, in fact, far less scary than the tyrant Manfred, who's trying to trap this young virgin, as she's called, Isabella, into an illegitimate marriage with him. Mm -hmm. So go back to that one. I think that you'd enjoy it, and it would make you smile too. <laughs> <laughs> and I would recommend Zofloya by Charlotte, Charlotte Dacre. Charlotte mm -hmm. Dacre, yeah. But I can't say anything about it because it's all about the twist. Yeah. So no spoilers, <laughs> just go and read it and you'll, it, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for all of your questions this evening. Thank I you. hope you've, uh, mm -hmm. thank you. Angela, and thank you, Amber. And um, we'll see you back on the platform. So uh, good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. <laughs>